tonight. New reigns. It's out with the old and in with the new in Russia as Putin's cabinet reshuffle sees a surprising swap of defense ministers with an aim on economic warfare. Polling underway. India continues with the fourth phase of elections. The opposition celebrating following the release of a key leader. Despite this, tensions threaten to spill into violence in the nation. Weather woes. From blazes being battled in Canada to the volcanic devastation in Indonesia and fatal floods sweeping Afghanistan, natural disasters pick up alarmingly across the globe. And solar spectacle. The Aurora Borealis graces European skies, putting on a once-in-a-lifetime show to stargazers from Tasmania all the way to Britain. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ala Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for taking the time to join us on World News Tonight. Our bulletin is packed with key updates from across the globe and we start off with the developments in Russia. The cabinet reshuffle in Russia saw some surprise changes to key posts. Russian President Vladimir Putin tapped a civilian economist as his surprise new defense minister in an attempt to guard Russia for economic war by trying to better utilize the defense budget and harness greater innovation to win in Ukraine. More than two years into the conflict, which has cost both sides heavy casualties, Putin proposed Andrei Belousov to replace his long-term ally, Sergei Shoigu, as defense minister. Belousov is a 65-year-old former deputy prime minister who specializes in economics and has played an important role in overseeing Russia's drone program. He is known to be very close to Putin and shares the Russian leader's vision of rebuilding a strong state. Meanwhile, Putin wants Shoigu to become the secretary of Russia's powerful security council. His new job is technically regarded as a step up to his defense ministry role, which ensures continuity and allows him to save face. Shoigu was heavily criticized by Russian military bloggers for a series of retreats the Russian military was forced to make in 2022. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said the change made sense because Russia was approaching a situation like the Soviet Union in the mid-1980s, when the military and law enforcement authorities accounted for 7.4% of gross domestic product. Peskov said that meant it was vital to ensure such spending was better integrated into the country's overall economy. It was why Putin now wanted a civilian economist in the defense ministry job, Peskov added. Russia's economists have so far largely ensured economic stability and growth despite the toughest sanctions ever imposed on a major economy. The changes are the most significant Putin has made since launching what he called a special military operation in Ukraine in 2022. They indicate Putin is eager to harness more of Russia's economy for the Ukraine war. And with the reshuffle, some discussions on international diplomacy have begun. Russia's President Vladimir Putin could be on his way to Vietnam soon in what would be his first state visit to the country since 2017. According to internal reports, Putin has accepted the invitation and that a date for a visit would be decided soon. And for more on this, we have other than world news special correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. Minoli, what's the latest? Yes, Sanuradi. The visit could take place as early as next week when the Russian leader will fly to Beijing for meetings with Chinese leaders. The Russian government has not revealed the dates of Putin's trip to China and some reports have speculated that Putin may stop in Vietnam on the way to or from China. Putin's visit would complement recent visits by US President Joe Biden, China's leader Xi Jinping and other top leaders who have been hosted by Vietnamese leaders in Hanoi. A visit by the Russian leader was mooted in late March when the General Secretary of the Communist Party of Vietnam took a call with Putin. A report also linked Putin's possible visit to the Vietnamese government's decision last week to postpone a visit by a top European Union official in charge of the bloc's sanctions policy. In this sense, a visit by Putin is due and should come as no surprise to officials and observers in Europe and North America. Back to you, Anuradhi.
All right, thank you very much. That was other than world news. Special correspondent Manoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. Over in China now, we have updates on some border tensions. Foreign Ministry of China urged the Philippines to stop making irresponsible remarks and to stop trying to mislead the international community after the Philippines accused China of building an artificial island in disputed waters. The Philippines said that it had deployed ships to a disputed area in the South China Sea where it accused China of building an island at the Sabina Shoal. The Office of President Ferdinand Macron Jr. said that the Coast Guard sent a ship to monitor the supposed illegal activities to China, creating an artificial island, adding two other vessels were in the rotational deployment in the area. China's Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wengbing said the accusations made by the Philippines against the Chinese side are groundless and purely fabricated. The shoal in the rendezvous point for vessels carrying out resupply missions to Filipino troops stationed on a grounded warship at the Second Thomas Shoal, where Manila and China have had frequent maritime run-ins. Now on India's elections, voters across India's restive Kashmir Valley cast their ballots in the fourth phase of India's seven-week-long general election. Meanwhile, a top Indian opposition leader was freed from jail on interim bail by the Supreme Court nearly seven weeks after his arrest in a bribery case. After 50 days, Arvind Kejriwal tasted freedom once more, released from jail nearly seven weeks after being arrested on bribery charges. I want to thank the judges of India's Supreme Court for letting me be here in front of you all today. I call on everyone to come together and save the country from dictatorship. Kejriwal, the leader of the Common Man's Party, is the chief elected official in the city of New Delhi and one of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's biggest critics. He was arrested back in March as his party was accused of taking $12 million in bribes from liquor contractors nearly two years ago. The court order enables him to campaign in the country's national election until the voting ends on the 1st of June. However, since he has only been released on bail, Kejriwal has not been exonerated in the bribery case. Critics have called Kejriwal's arrest politically motivated. He's among several government opponents under investigation as the ruling BJP party are accused of trying to sideline its opponents ahead of the vote. For their part, the government have denied any wrongdoing, saying that the investigative agencies were just doing their job. On the Israel-Palestine conflict now, Israel has called for Palestinians in more areas of Gaza's southern city of Rafah to evacuate and head to what it calls an expanded humanitarian area in Al-Mawasi, in a further indication that the military is pressing ahead with its plans for a ground attack on Rafah. Meanwhile, Israeli forces continue to carry out airstrikes across the Strip, killing dozens in central and northern Gaza. Smoke rises over Rafah on Saturday as Israel calls for Palestinians to evacuate and head to what it calls an expanded humanitarian area in Al Mawasi. It's a further indication that the military is pressing ahead with its plans for a ground attack on Gaza's southern city. That's despite heavy US pressure and alarm expressed by residents and humanitarian groups. In a post on social media site X, a military spokesperson called on residents and displaced people in 12 neighborhoods in the enclave to go immediately to the shelters west of Gaza City. <laughs> Gaza resident Nidal says despite the warning, he is unable to evacuate. <laughs> he told he doesn't have a tent as they were all distributed yesterday, nor does he have cash to get a vehicle to move his belongings. These evacuations follow overnight Israeli jet strikes across the enclave. Israel's military said it was continuing precise operational activity against Hamas fighters in eastern Rafah and on the Gazan side of the Rafah crossing. On Friday, Israeli tanks captured the main roads dividing Rafah's eastern and western sections, effectively encircling the eastern side in an assault that has caused Washington to hold up delivery of some military aid to its ally. The latest evacuation orders came hours after internationally mediated ceasefire talks appeared to falter, with Hamas saying Israel's rejection of the truce offer returned things to square one. Israel says it wants to reach a deal under which hostages would be released in exchange for the freeing of Palestinian prisoners held by Israel, but that it is not prepared to end the military offensive which was triggered by a Hamas-led attack on southern Israel on October 7th. 
1,200 people were killed and more than 250 people were taken hostage in the attack, according to Israeli tallies. Israel's military operation in Gaza, which it says aims to eliminate Hamas, has killed close to 35,000 Palestinians, according to Gaza's health ministry. Still on the conflict now, some hopeful developments as the United Nations General Assembly overwhelmingly backed a Palestinian bid to become a full UN member by recognizing it as qualified to join and recommending the UN Security Council reconsider the matter favorably. The vote serves as a global survey of support after the United States vetoed the idea in the UN Security Council a month prior. The Palestinian push for full UN membership comes seven months into a war between Israel and Palestinian militants Hamas in the Gaza Strip. And as Israel is expanding settlements in the occupied West Bank, which the UN considers to be illegal. We want peace. We want freedom. Palestinian UN Ambassador Riyad Mansour spoke to the assembly before the vote. A yes vote is a vote for Palestinian existence. It is not against any state. It is an investment in peace and thus empowers the forces of peace. Meanwhile, Israel's ambassador to the United Nations, Gilad Erdan, who spoke after Mansour, accused the assembly of shredding the UN Charter. The vote by the General Assembly Friday does not give the Palestinians full UN membership, but simply recognizes them as qualified to join. An application to become a full UN member first needs to be approved by the 15-member Security Council and then the General Assembly. If the measure is again voted on by the council, it is likely to face the same fate, a U.S. veto. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. And on the road to the White House tonight, the campaign trail continues to be set ablaze as former President Donald Trump held a massive rally on the Jersey Shore ahead of a trial where his former attorney Michael Cohen is expected to take the stand. Out of court and back on the campaign trail, Donald Trump buoyed by thousands of supporters overnight. Thank you very much, Robert. His team boasting it was the biggest crowd they've seen this year. As you can see today, we're expanding the electoral map because we are going to officially play in the state of New Jersey. The former president taking advantage of the weekend before returning to that New York City courtroom Monday as the criminal hush money trial goes forward. His supporters saying they're sticking with him. Michael Cohen, once Trump's personal lawyer, set to take the stand this week. In 2016, it was Cohen who paid $130,000 to porn star Stormy Daniels to keep her account of alleged extramarital sex with Trump out of the papers before the election. Trump denies the affair, but Cohen is already proving to be a problematic witness, taunting Trump online and appearing in a TikTok video wearing a T-shirt showing Trump behind bars in an orange jumpsuit. Trump 2024, more like Trump 20 to 24 years. The judge saying it has to stop. Our latest ABC News Ipsos poll saying 80% of Trump supporters say they will still support him even if he's convicted. 16% say they will reconsider and 4% withdraw their vote entirely. We have a series of alarming weather updates to bring to you now, starting off in Canada. The season's first major wildfires started to spread nearly 20,000 acres across Western Canada as authorities issued an evacuation order for thousands of residents in British Columbia and warned of poor air quality across the country. Evacuees lined up to get emergency support in Fort St. John over the weekend. Across the border in Alberta, residents of Fort McMurray were told to prepare to leave. <sighs> Eyewitness video captured on Friday showed fire blocking a highway that connects Alberta to the Northwest Territories. The season started again. Authorities in Alberta said six crews of firefighters along with 13 helicopters and air tankers were working to tame the fire on Sunday. They said the blaze had subdued but was expected to spread again as the temperatures soar. Meanwhile, Canada's Weather Service issued a special air quality statement extending from British Columbia to Ontario on Sunday, 
The federal government warned of another catastrophic wildfire season as it forecast higher than normal spring and summer temperatures, boosted by El Nino weather conditions. Canada experienced one of its warmest winters with low to non-existent snow in many areas, raising fears that a hot summer would trigger wildfires amid an ongoing drought. And over in Indonesia, over 40 people have now been confirmed dead after hours of torrential rain triggered flash floods and cold lava flow from a volcano in the western region. Multiple people remained missing after the downpour swept ash and large rocks down Mount Marapi, the most active volcano on Sumatra Island. For updates on the region, we have other than a world news special correspondent Nevanmi Ranasinghe from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Nevanmi. Thank you, Anuradi. Three people are missing in the Agam district and 14 in Tanadatta, both the worst hit areas of the flood and home to hundreds of thousands of people. About 400 people, including police, soldiers and local rescue teams, have been deployed to search for the missing using at least eight excavators and drones. Marapi erupted in December, killing more than 20 people. The rain turned roads into muddy rivers swept vehicles away and damaged homes and other buildings. Damage to the roads has hampered rescue efforts. Indonesia is prone to landslides and floods during the rainy season. In 2022, about 24,000 people were evacuated and two children were killed in the floods on Sumatra Island, with environmental campaigners blaming deforestation caused by lodging for worsening the disaster. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a world news special correspondent Nevami Ranasinghe from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. More weather woes across the globe now. Flash floods caused by heavy rains devastated villages in northern Afghanistan, killing over 300 people and injuring more than 1,600 as villagers buried their dead and aid agencies warned of havoc. Hundreds of people have been killed and more than 1,600 injured in flash flooding in northern Afghanistan, authorities said on Sunday. The Taliban-run refugee ministry says thousands of homes have been damaged and livestock wiped out following heavy rain. Meanwhile, aid groups warn of widening havoc as healthcare facilities and vital infrastructure have also been damaged. Moving forward isn't simple and people are struggling to cope. In a statement, the Taliban's economy minister urged the United Nations and private businesses to provide support for those affected by the flooding. Afghanistan is prone to natural disasters, and the UN considers it one of the countries most vulnerable to climate change. But following the Taliban takeover after foreign forces withdrew in 2021, it's battled a shortfall in aid. That's because development aid that formed the backbone of government finances was cut. This has worsened in subsequent years as foreign governments grapple with competing global crises and growing condemnation of the Taliban's curbs on Afghan women. Over in Peru, we have political problems. Authorities arrested President Dina Boluarte's brother and lawyer over influence peddling accusations, a day after the South American country's government disbanded a police unit that assisted prosecutors in investigating the president's inner circle. Surrounded by police, Nicanor Boluarte is taken to a judicial unit. On Friday, the Peruvian president's brother was arrested over his alleged involvement in an influence peddling scheme, an accusation that he denies. Police searched Mr. Boluarte's home along with 19 other properties, including that of the president's lawyer, who is advising her in the illicit enrichment inquiry dubbed Rolexgate. Prosecutors accuse him of intervening with the investigation against Mr. Boluarte, who, along with others, will be held in detention according to the Peruvian judiciary. The judiciary today ordered the preliminary detention of Nicanor Boluarte Zaguerra and others for 10 days in the criminal organisation investigation, taking into account that the requirements of the criminal procedure code were met. Speaking at an event, the president did not mention the arrests, but said that she had faith in Peru's justice system. Authorities later said they were looking into a potential abuse of authority by Boluarte for disbanding a police unit that had been investigating her brother. 
It's the latest setback for the president, who is already being investigated over how she obtained expensive Rolex watches and jewellery she had allegedly not declared. Bolwate has denied the accusations. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. How much would you give to see the Northern Lights? Well, millions of lucky people across Europe got to bask in the sights of the Aurora Borealis for free. The most powerful solar storm in more than two decades struck Earth, triggering spectacular celestial light shows from Tasmania all the way to Britain. From Tasmania to Edinburgh, Paris to Michigan, lucky people stepped outside last night to bask under a beautiful sky. The northern and southern lights were the strongest they've been in decades, as the Earth was hit by the first extreme category solar storm since 2003. What happened during the last few days, there is um, a system of very complex sunspots that came together and formed a huge active region of the sun. And these are extremely active in the span of a day or a day and a half. They launched, uh, I believe, something like seven coronal mass ejections. Plasma, the charged particles, the magnetic field that makes up the sun, part of it actually lifts off the sun and streams away into space. The storm will continue into the weekend, so those ruining a missed opportunity might get another shot at catching the display. But watch out, the interference with Earth's magnetic field also threatens possible disruptions. Authorities have notified satellite operators, airlines and the power grid to take precautionary measures. Changing magnetic fields can charge cables with currents that they aren't designed to handle, potentially leading to blackouts. Well, I for one would be able to give anything to be able to witness the beautiful sight. And that's all the stories we have to report to you tonight on World News. Tune in again tomorrow for more key updates from across the globe. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good night.